Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Margaret Rankel and Mary Laura Philpot. Thanks for joining us tonight. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of nearly 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for a few introductions. Margaret Rankel is the author of Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss, and Graceland at Last, Notes on Hope and Heartache from the American South. Her latest book is 2023's The Comfort of Crows. She is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times where her essays appear weekly. A Nashville resident, Margaret is the founding editor of Chapter 16, a daily literary publication of Humanities Tennessee. Joining Margaret is Mary Laura Philpot, the author of the 2022 memoir, Bomb Shelter, Love, Time, and Other Explosives, I simply love that title, which was awarded the Southern Book Prize, chosen by Cheryl Strayed's Wild Reads Book Club, and named an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review and one of the best books of the year by NPR. Mark, uh, Mary, excuse me, Mary Laura is also the author of the national bestseller, I Miss You When I Blink, which was named one of NPR's favorite books of 2019 and a finalist for the Southern Book Prize. It's now my pleasure to welcome both Margaret Rankel and Mary Laura Philpot. Hi, Fred. Hey. Long time no see. (laughs) This is, I feel like we should tell everybody, I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can see your pretty face. I feel like we should tell everybody that this is not normally how we chat. Like normally either we're on the phone because one of us is somewhere and one of us is somewhere else, or we're just in your house or in my house. That very room on, in your house. Yes. So to be on screens, but in our own homes a mile apart is actually really weird. It's very funny weird. to me that, yeah. But um, this we decided this was the best because you've been on tour and you were in another city earlier today. And this way you can turn off your computer and fall right to sleep tonight, which is what you need. I also remember the last time we did a Zoom together in the same room, um, I had to keep remembering to turn toward the camera because I wanted to turn toward (laughs) you. So this way I get to turn toward you and turn toward the camera. This way we do remember we have a camera on. Um, I want to I want to brag a little bit about you and about this book. But before I brag about this book, I want to just flat out brag about how lucky I am to get to be your friend and try to explain just how much I wish everybody could have this experience of having a friend who is like, okay, here's my best friend. And also we're like, we're not coworkers or like, you know, we're not producing the same thing. It's not like when you and Billy work on a book, we're working on different things, but we're kind of like colleagues in that we're both working at the same time. And anytime I have any kind of problem or question what or whatever you're my first call you know whether it's like this essay isn't working why do I sound like a weirdo how do I fix it or you know a a creative business problem like there's this weird thing in my contract do you think this is weird what should we do about it and it's just it's such a wonderful stroke of luck to have a brilliant friend and when I picked that adjective brilliant to say it reminded me do you remember this email that you printed out for me? You know what? I was just today, I was thinking, how long ago did we did we write that email? What year was it? October 2015. We knew each other. I had lived here for a year and we kind of sort of knew each other, but only like professionally and not super close. I had been working on some stuff of my own. You had been working on some stuff of your own. And I sent you this email and I wrote, Madam Wrinkle, I have an enormous favor to ask of you. And it's so weird. I can probably only ask it by phone. I don't know why I thought it was that weird. It's a reading and thinking favor. And honestly, you are exactly the reader and thinker for the task. But you might be like, oh, gag, I don't want to do that, which would be fine. But I still have to ask because you are brilliant. So give me a call. And then I called you and I said, hey, what if we like read each other's stuff and gave each other thoughts and feedback? And that's how it started. Well, you were sort of shy about it. I'm, I've started writing these 
things. I don't really know what you call them. They're true, but they're sort of little short stories. And I remember saying, I'm doing that too. I'm writing these little things. And we ended up roping in some other friend, writer friends. And, and we, it's like, we always say, we wrote, we, we, we write our books at each other's kitchen tables because yeah, I miss you when I blink came out three months before, Mm -hmm. um, before, before late migrations and late migrations. Yeah. And so um, it really is kind of a sister writer arrangement. Yeah. We've when had five books non- since then. When you write nonfiction though, you're telling, um, you're telling really sometimes hard truths you're revealing. So it's sort of a, a I think of it as almost like a crash course in friendship because the kinds of things that you would normally do over mm-hmm. long periods of time, meeting a friend at the park with your babies or um, somebody who's just down the hall in your college dorm or wh- wh- however, it, th- those are, those kinds of stories are slower to unfold. And so yes. you, um, I mean, you hardly knew me, but suddenly you knew how I felt about my mother's death. And yeah. I knew how you, how you felt about living in a life that didn't feel like you made all the choices that led to that life, but it, and that's, I miss you when I blink, but you, the, you were trying to figure out who you were and that was really, it truly was a gift. It was a gift. Yeah. Yeah. You're right though. It does. It accelerates friendship really fast. Cause it's like, Hey, why don't we sit down for coffee and hear all my innermost thoughts that I've been trying to put into words. Give me yours. It does. It speeds things along. And some of Um, those things are like not necessarily pretty truths. And so it's like, you you don't mean it to be, but it's almost like a little test. Can she, exactly? (laughs) can she accept these truths about me? Yeah. And if so, just wait for next week's chapter. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Okay. Now we get to talk about this beautiful, wonderful book of my soul. And there's a part I want you to read in a little while. There's some parts, there are all sorts of parts I want to talk about, but I, I want to start at the very beginning with the prologue because it is a lovely essay in its own right, but it's a little different from the rest of the book. It's different from the rest of the essay chapters. Um, every essay in this book gets its own title, which I love. I love that you do that. And the title of your prologue is wherever you are, stop what you're doing. Why that imperative? Do you really not remember this? I do, but I want you to tell everybody else. Okay. Well, so you have to know that sometimes we, the whole plan of a writer's group is that people show up with pieces of writing that they want to share and get feedback on. And sometimes our little group convenes and there's nothing to share. We don't, nobody's done any writing or the writing they've done is not really at a point. It's part of a longer piece and it's not really coherent enough to share. So I, I remember saying to all y'all at your kitchen table, let's, let's have a prompt. And the prompt was wherever you, where, where, wherever you are, stop what you're doing. And the first draft of it was right there where those flowers are. That's where I wrote it. Um, but it was, do you remember, it was originally an essay in the book and one Mm -hmm. of the 52 weeks. And then y'all all all said, this is sort of the, this sort of sets out some of the key themes of the book. So, you know, just go on and write another essay for that week. And we'll use this one. I think you should use that one as a prologue. And I think it's true. It's the idea that we are so distracted in our daily lives, we're so busy and so fast and we're always doing so many things at once. We never stop unless we're obliged to stop because we just fall down and give up and go to sleep. Um, But the, the trick I think to feeling connected is to stop and pay attention. And, and I, and I liken it really to falling in love when you're falling in love 
there's nothing more that you want to do than to stop and gaze at one another and listen and touch and smell. And if we do those things to our lives and especially to the natural world that surrounds us, it has this effect of like this calming kind of effect. It, it slows our breath, it slows our heart rate, it lowers our blood pressure. We, Mm -hmm. we are living creatures too, as much as we might forget that. Um, Yeah. And we, and we live at a speed that we have not evolved to live at. So the exhortation to stop wherever you are, stop what you're doing, stop and see this, stop and hear this, stop and um, consider this, it's a, it's, um, it should, it should sort of tell you what you're about to experience in the book, but, but not, it's a little bit more, um, I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of essays in the book. There are funny essays, there are um, stories, there Mm -hmm. are, there, there's advice. This one's not characteristic, as you say, of everything that's in the book, but it does set out some themes. It does. And it, the other thing it does that I love, and I love when a prologue can pull this off and it's not always possible, but it kind of tells the reader how to use this book. Because like you just said, it's telling you to stop and, and stopping and using your senses brings your breathe, makes your breathing slower, makes your heart rate slow down. That's meditation. It's you're telling people what this is. If you use this the way it is intended, you know, with one essay every day, every week, whatever you are, you are going to be creating a meditative habit. And that meditative habit is going to be good for you and good for everyone around you. And you're also telling people to think about the, one of the main themes of this book, which is kinship. Mm -hmm. Why kinship? It's partly because I think that we have forgotten that mm-hmm. we do belong to the world. You know, we 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 live in our heated and air conditioned houses. We drive around in our heated and air conditioned cars. Some some people go straight from the car into the house. My house doesn't have a garage, but a lot of people just pull straight in and they aren't experiencing the other creatures with whom they share their habitat. And yeah. so we have developed this us versus them attitude toward everything else, all the other living things that share the world with us. And we aren't different. I mean, we're different in some ways, um, different in kind and different in degree, but we have more in common than we probably feel comfortable thinking about. Like I I remember in school um, when I was in college, so, so many of my humanities classes were about establishing that, you know, human beings are, are the, the, the homeo sapiens is the, is the species that reasons homeo, mm-hmm. you know, homo sapiens is the species with humor. There were all these defining characteristics that made us human. But if you're paying attention, you know, that crows, for example, have a witty a very witty sense of humor and play tricks on each other and on other creatures all the time, just Mm -hmm. for the fun of it. If you're paying attention, you know that the bones of your hand match in so many ways, the bones of the duck's webbed foot. Yeah. I love that. I love that. The turtle's foot. We have all these ways that we belong to the natural world Mm -hmm. and that we belong to one another that we don't feel we don't feel that kinship. And I, and I, and I wonder if the fact that we so rarely recognize ourselves as kin to the creatures who share our, our world, if that's not part of the reason we got ourselves into this mess with the extinction yeah. crisis and the climate crisis. It absolutely is. That's why I love that you, I love that you set that out right at the beginning. Um, you're a little bit ahead of me on this relationship with the seasons. You and I both started out in life as people who like summer and springtime, and I'm coming around to embracing fall and winter, but you really love fall and winter now. I do. I love, I've always loved to fall, but my birthday is in fall. 
Your yeah. birthday doesn't fall too. Why don't you love fall? I because everything dies and you know it's a little it's, it's a little sad for um it's sad and it gets dark at four. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but, but you've I embraced it. It's so it's one of the seasons of change mm-hmm. where every single day you can go outside and it looks a little different. There's mm-hmm. an, a different shade of color coming, creeping into the leaves. There's, it's so obvious that the, the creatures are stocking up, you know, the yeah. hummingbirds are fattening up and fighting over the feeders and the squirrels are gathering and the chipmunks are gathering everything. And, and the chipmunks walk around with these <laughs> giant cheeks full of acorns and, and it's just jolly and fun to see to see that season of change. But then winter, I have I have had to work a little harder with winter. But I love winter because it's sort of like rooting for the underdog these days, isn't it? I mean, I feel a little <laughs> bit like winter. Like when my you know, I'm the I, I walk into the family room. I've never watched a football game in my entire life, but I would walk through the family room where people this is one thing you and I share, but we walk through the family room where, where my family's watching a football game and my my I say, you know, who's supposed to win? And then I root for the other one. That's that's just an instinct I have. And I don't know, winter feels so fragile to me now. So yeah. I'm so tenuous and it's hard not to love something that I don't know needs protection dwindling. yeah it's dwindling um on that note when it's starting to get dark at four o'clock in the afternoon here one of the things that I need is to remember that that's temporary um would you do just a, a wee small reading would you read because this re- this is one of the parts that reminds me that winter is temporary it's on page 55 it's this lovely essay called wild joy would you read us like the first half through the middle of the page on page 56 starting with the beginning of 55 Mm -hmm. yes this is a happy one this will cheer since we've been talking about extinction maybe we need a happy one although there's some yeah okay um (laughs) (laughs) this is called wild joy It falls in winter week 12, and there's an epigraph. Notes on springtime and on anything else that comes to mind of an intoxicating nature. E.B. White, One Man's Meat. March comes in like a lion, except when it comes in like a lamb, or when it comes in like a chorus, a symphony, and an exquisitely choreographed ballet all at once. A performance so breathtaking it could not possibly be replicated. It is replicated anyway, one day after another. Cue the waking insects stirring in the leaf litter. Cue the flashing bluebirds swooping from the bare maple branches to reap the insects stirring in the leaf litter. Cue the fox in his magnificent coat shining in the moonlight, his ears pricked, his tail curled around his beautiful fox feet. Cue the hard brown buds, waiting, waiting, all through winter, but just beginning to quiver. Any day now, any day, they will warm into blossom. I treasure every iridescent green bee waking to feed on the first vanishing bloodroot flower, the first ephemeral spring beauty, the first woodland violet and cut leaf toothwort. Soon there will be trilliums and trout lilies too. Any day now, toad shade trilliums and trout lilies. If you tell me I don't, Deserve this joy you are telling me nothing I don't already know. From the very first hominid to rise up on bare feet and stumble across a field of blooming grass, we have been burning this world down. I know that. I am in love with the mild light of the coming springtime anyway, with the shivering joy of the coming springtime. 
with all the beguiling creatures of the coming springtime. Come to the woods and stand with me in the sunshine beneath the trees. Watch the bluebirds diving for insects. Watch them peeking into the nest holes the woodpeckers carved out years ago. Listen to the cry of the woodpeckers in the echoing woods. Let it lift your heart. Let it still your busy hands and feet. And let it still your worried mind. Listen with everything you are. With all you are, listen for the hum and flutter of the waking world. The upland chorus frogs are singing. It is a song of full-throated promise. It's beginning again. It's all beginning again. I love it so much. I also <laughs> just love to hear you read your work. You have such a, it's like puts me in a trance. I love it. Um, thank you for reading that. Will you kind of talk to everybody about why this is the structure you chose for the book? Why this seasonal structure, 52 weeks? It, I mean, it obviously works beautifully, but I mean, this could have been just, a, it could have been like late migrations, just a collection of essays that kind of are loosely tied around a theme. Why structure it this way? Well, as you know, I struggled mightily with the structure of late migrations. Yes, I do. I remember watching <laughs> you what, at, at, at the Rivendell Writers Colony, watching you dr draw out a, a, a plot line, a little ray of sun coming out for every one of your essays. Planning the structure of a book is hard. So mm -hmm. pragmatically, that solved a big problem. But I also, I thought when I was on tour with Late Migrations, I it was an in and out book tour. There was a, a lot of going out and coming back in for a few days, going out and coming back in for a few days. And towards the end, I had um, some of the people who showed up had many of them had already read the book and had questions. And they were saying to me, I just slowed down when I was reading this book. I just kept slowing down and parceling them out. Um, just one a night or sometimes two a night if they were really short because I it helped me get settled. It helped me focus and consider bigger issues, issues of life and death, issues of love and loss. And, and one of them actually said to me, almost like a devotional. And I remember thinking back in, I don't know, September of 2019, what if I wrote a whole book that was meant to be read that way? What if I what if I, I, it, it was supposed to be something that slowed down and, um, and when was meant to invite pondering and thinking. And the most obvious way to do that was the way devotionals are set up. Think about my grandmother and my great grandmother with their little, little bitty upper room magazine yeah. and reading their, um, for them, it was a, you know, a Christian devotional, but they don't, a, a devotional doesn't have to be focused on a particular spiritual framework or um, religious tradition. It's it's just that it's just the idea that we should give ourselves permission to think on higher things, not not to be completely absorbed by the day in and day out, but to give ourselves permission to ponder and linger and think about the world we live in and the gift it is that life is when you, when you, you think about this world and the miracle of being here in it, it's hard to imagine how we manage to get any dishes washed or any bills paid. Why aren't we doing nothing but lingering in the beauty and the yeah. and the magic of life and so it was sort of my idea was to set it up to encourage a little bit of that I love it I, I wonder how many people will read it that way and how many people will just tear through it I've it's, I've torn through a, it now there's multiple a way times, to but. tear through it for sure because um because one thing um we we all talked about in the writers group is that you know the 
there does need even in an essay collection there needs to be recurrent themes there needs but it works best if there's some kind of through line yeah. so the images from the beginning of the book get picked up again midway not not necessarily telling a story but that um that weave these 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 experiences together and to explain how it could be a book and not just a stack of essays b- between covers so there is a kind of a, a a little bit of a thread like that through mm-hmm. through the book but it isn't um it isn't a narrative but you could read it that way if you want yeah. it's i think it's fun to read both ways i say tear through it and then go back to the beginning and go one at a time you know um, several people have told me they they they're doing that like they're yeah. going to read it now cuz but they're yes. going to start again with the first day of winter, the first week of winter, which I'm following, there there are two ways to measure seasons. One is the meteorological seasons, which which um, as you can tell from the term itself, it's it's basically weather based. So in the meteorological understanding of winter, the first week of winter is the first week of December. But mm-hmm. in the astronomical view of of the seasons, which has to do with the tilt of the Earth on its axis in its rotation around the sun, the first day of winter is December 21st, the winter solstice. It's the 20th, 20th some years and the 21st some years, depending on the exact hours. But um, but yeah, you could start again with week one on December right. 21st. That's what I recommend. Do you remember when we were talking about the quotes? You've, you've pulled all these lovely quotes from other writers and you've put them not at the top of every single essay, but at a lot. Like the one you just read had E.B. White something from E.B. White at the beginning. Do you remember when we were kind of debating that? I remember you didn't want me to do it. I didn't want you to do it. I was wrong. Oh. You were right. They work beautifully. <laughs> but but no, why but did you, you feel so point. strongly? You had a really good point. And I thought about it hard because, because you know, our, our, our other sister writer, Maria Browning, um, mm-hmm. who uh, she was with you on this. She She completely agreed with you that if the S the whole point of a personal essay is that it's personal. And so why would you start a personal essay with somebody else's words? And I, and I heard that and I really did think about that, but I think it ultimately what made me want to do it enough to override the two writers I respect most in the world is that it's that idea of kinship, you know, like, yeah. I I didn't want this. I wanted to open the conversation as much as I could to the reality that I did not invent this form or certainly Mm -hmm. I did not invent nature writing. So there are a lot of, there's a long, um, lovely tradition of writers who, who write about the nearby natural world, not I don't, I don't mean like Cheryl Strayed hiking the Pacific Crest Trail or yeah. Bill Bryson hiking the Appalachian Trail. That's a different kind of nature writing or a different kind of personal investment and confrontation with the natural world. I'm talking about just the world we walk through getting onto a train or getting into mm-hmm. a car. And the the idea of bringing in these other voices a, as a kind of dialogue appealed to me. It reminds me, like when I think of you doing it, and it again, you were right. That was the right thing to do. But I think of you pulling these little lines from books that you have on your bookshelves and on your coffee table. And it reminds me of the way birds go and find like little <laughs> threads or strings or hairs or pieces of pine straw and they make it into a nest. You did exactly what you needed to do for this book and it worked and it's right. Um, I, I, I want to talk about another little structural thing that you did in here, and that's the praise songs, which I think it's obvious when you read this book, what's what purpose they are serving lyrically and thematically, but will you also kind of talk about what purpose they serve in terms of physical layout of the book and, and talk a little bit about Billy's work? Well, there's, there, there, there are two things. One is that when I, when I planned the idea of a, of a trek through the seasons week by week, Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be more transparent and about than I had been at 
with late migrations. With late migrations, mm-hmm. the natural world is my solace. It's my consolation in the face of grief, of recognizing that we are part of these cycles. It, it and when we aren't singled out for suffering when we suffer. But but it, I, I feel like taking that approach was a little bit unfair to the reality that we face. Because when you do pay attention to the natural world, you are going to encounter some things that are difficult, especially yes. now. Especially if you are a person who has habitually done this, you're going to notice fewer birds in the flocks that that come to, well, for us here in, in the South, the, the migratory flocks that come down for the winter, there'll be, there are fewer birds in those. There's just no denying that. Um, I have, you know, I haven't seen a frog or a toad in this yard in two decades. It's hard it's hard to reckon with those losses of that magnitude. And so I thought of the praise songs. These are just little bitty. I'm showing people what they look like. They're just little little bitty short. Short things in italics. They're just love letters, just without any kind of um, caveat, like we're losing it, nothing like that. It's just, and I wanted them to balance what I was, was afraid might be more darkness than anybody would willingly sign up for it. As it turns out, there's not as much darkness in it as I had feared. Um, There might be. I don't think, I don't think of it as a dark book. I remember you kept saying, Oh gosh, people are going to think it's so dark. It's this doesn't, I think of it as a very joyful book. It is. It exists during a dark time, but it's kind of like, yeah. I mean, there, the, the reality is that we hold joy and grief really close, both of mm-hmm. them all the time. But, but there, but as you mentioned, there is a very practical way reason for these prairie songs. One is that it's, it was to accommodate the art. So if you look at the beginning of every essay there, the essays all begin on the right hand side of the spread. And there's a piece of artwork on the left hand side that is made by my brother, Billy Wrinkle, a collage artist. And he also did the art and the cover for Late Migrations. He did the cover for my second book, Graceland at Last. Um, But when you're writing a a devotional, one of the, I I just kept thinking about the, you know, the the illuminated manuscripts of the early church, the, the, the way the beauty of the art amplified and um and enlarged the message of the words and i wanted the same thing for this book but the problem is the layout like if you are gonna have an essay a picture with every essay what happens if the essay doesn't end on the on the right hand side what happens if the essay ends right here See, these are things we have to think about when we make books. <laughs> you can't put a piece of art there because it'll visually, it'll look like it goes with this page rather mm-hmm. than with the very next page. But if you have some little bitty, little bitty shout for joy over here in mm-hmm. italics, you can then turn the page and have a new piece of art beginning with the next full essay. Problem solved. I thought about this. I did. I thought about it. <laughs> Very I was handy. afraid somebody would try to talk me out of having so much art and I was not going to be budged. I was going to have 52 pieces of art. And you pulled it off, which is, I mean, there was art in late migrations, but this is way more. It's way more and it's way more complicated art. Billy, yes. Billy took an entire year to make this art. Yeah. And with late migrations, he basically had a summer. We weren't mm-hmm. sure that um, it, I'll, I'll have a little side sidebar for the readers among us. If you wonder why pre-orders are so, so important to the writers you love, it's that it gives the publisher and the distributor a sense of how big or not the audience for a book might be. And there were enough pre-orders for late migrations that 
um, the publisher decided that they could invest in some some artwork, but he did. Billy didn't have much time to do it. But we knew from the beginning with this book yeah. that there were going to be fifty two pieces, and he he actually made it harder than it kind of needed to be because he wanted <laughs> he kind of wanted there to be it, one thing that you'll notice if you flip through it. It's not it's not immediately obvious unless you're doing this where you're seeing. But all the winter, all the artworks for winter have a blue background. So the backgrounds, handmade paper tinted blue, and then all the ones for spring have, you know, a little green backdrop. So, and then summer, it's sort of gold um, and autumn, it's just sort of, you know, brown, but mm -hmm. he was very carefully laying out a whole season's worth of artwork and creating elements so that there was a narrative to the seasons. You you would you would be walking through the seasons visually the way you would be walking through the seasons in your life, seeing certain oh yo oh yes the hummingbirds are going to show up towards the end of spring and yeah and they're going to disappear again in early autumn and and making sure that all the uh, like there weren't two really complicated pieces one right after another some of the simpler ones would break up the complexities and he it was a big deal for him to make all that yeah. art. Of course. I mean, of course he did all that. It reminds me of, you have a great line somewhere, somewhere in this book where you say something like driving due South in spring is like speeding up time. And I feel like if going like this is like speeding up time. <laughs> That's like exactly just, what it's like. You see, yep. Like you see the light change throughout the book. Um, what was it like working with Billy? I mean, I kind of know, cause I received a lot of those phone calls where you were like, yeah, I just got off the phone with Billy. He, I mean, he, he's such a genius and you're such a genius. And the two of you together, I think you have a good time working together. We do, but he drove me out of my mind with this book <laughs> because he, because he kept, it, you know, he kept changing his mind about things and <laughs> And I would say, and, and I was just panicking because I didn't want to give my brother a heart attack, but he was trying to teach full-time as an art professor and be a decent spouse mm -hmm. to my sister-in-law and father to their, their three adult children. Um, because as you know, adult children still need their parents sometimes. Still and, children. And um yeah. And, and, you know, I just didn't want to stress him out, but, you know, I'd get these texts from him and it'd be 11 o'clock and he'd be back in the studio working on this artwork because he had been, at, he had had to go to an art show, you know, an open, anyway, I just kept saying, let's change it. Let's just change it. Let's, let's, let's say we, we need another three months. And, and he would say, no, 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 I'm going to get it finished. And I'd say, well, how many have you finished? And he would say, none. <laughs> I was like, ah, but, um, <laughs> but I, I, I did. I, so I wasn't really entirely trusting of my baby brother in terms of time management, but I completely, wholeheartedly, 100% trusted his aesthetic. So yeah. he, um, you know, I, I knew that what he did would be beautiful. And so, you know, there wasn't, I think he might have a slightly different answer to this. I think I maybe wasn't as entirely hands-off as I believed myself to have been, but I, <laughs> I do, I do think, um, you know, that my, my role once we, you know, I just sort of said, I want, I, I just want it to be lush and beautiful and tangly and wild. I want people to look at the pictures in this book and read the words in this book and come away saying, I want a wild yard too. And yeah. make it as visually appealing and intoxicating as you can. And that's what he did. Yeah. Yeah. You could trust him to do it. Um, speaking of family, you've got, you've got cameos in here from the boys, your three grown sons. You got Haywood, your husband, shout out to Haywood, your deceased parents, in-laws, your family is all over this book. Can you talk a little bit about what it is, how it feels? And I've given this a lot of thought. When you write a book that goes out into the world and it, and it goes and lives its life in the brains and souls of other people, it becomes a thing that is someone else's, but it has so much of your heart in it. And it's, it's also kind of a, a personal time capsule 
for you? That's right. What does that feel like? Well, I know I've you tried, and I have tried to argue this yeah. so much because there are so many questions that come up when there are other people in your life mm-hmm. and therefore in your work because they didn't ask to be, well, apart from Haywood and <laughs> John, who knew they were marrying writers. Right. You know, no, no, no parent ever said, oh gosh, I hope my child grows up to be a writer and writes about me. You know, <laughs> no, no sibling does that. No, certainly no child ever does mm-hmm. that. So there's definitely a sense of wrestling a little bit with the responsibility of what it means to tell your own story and what, what moral and ethical obligations you have to the people in your story. And you helped me clarify that because it was such a big, I'm going to hold this up while we're holding up books. It was such a big part of Bomb Shelter, your second book. It was a, it was a lot about, uh, a lot of this was in, I miss you when I blink as well, but, but it was a much bigger thing in Bomb Shelter because, um, because, it, there were, your children were in there. There were just, there was no way to write that story without them. And you wanted to protect their privacy. Mm-hmm. And you wanted to make sure that 20 years from now, they didn't look back and say, what was my mother even thinking? And I think a lot of people wrestle with this in terms of social media. You know, yeah. are we going to, yeah. are we going to let our children be, be their faces be, be seen on social media? So it's not just for writers, but, um, but you really helped me clarify that in, in, in that I'm writing about myself and I'm only including enough about the other people to make it clear that I'm not living alone in the world with no, with no other people in it. Right. Um, And, and I think that, you know, like, for example, I don't name my children in, in the book. I don't name my, my parents or my grandparents or my father-in-law. Um, I do name Haywood and I wrestled with that and I do name Billy, but um, well, Billy's name is right here. So that's right. But he, <laughs> he appears as a, as, um, as my little brother in one of the essays. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I was kind of trying to be careful about that, how I did that. Yeah. Um, the title how did we land here on the comfort of crows, which I love and is perfect, but there were many titles before this title and there are many variations on this title and hundreds. subtitle. Hundreds yes. and hundreds. Yes. Um, well, I wanted, as you know, crows to be in the title from the very beginning. Yes. But there was some concern um, that maybe crows were not very popular birds. Like that maybe crows, people often hate crows because they are black and they're big and they're loud. They don't have a musical kind of song. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, we have that really um, prejudicial bird collective, a murder of crows. And um, so there's a lot of that's a lot of work for a title to have to overcome. So I can understand the, the 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 people in the writers group, the people in my publisher, Spiegel and Growl, the people um, in my life who might say, why crows? Like people will ask my husband, what's Margaret's favorite bird? Knowing how much I love birds. And he'll say, you're not even going to believe it because <laughs> it's, it's not what they expect. And, but the truth is that crows are more like us than any other creature in nearby nature. Like we don't live, we don't live in Africa with sharing the ecosystem with the great apes, you know? Mm -hmm. So aside from the great apes, corvids, the family of birds to which crows and blue jays and ravens belong, not just blue jays, stellar jays, if you're looking if you're tuning in from the West coast, all those J's and magpies, if you're, um, if you're out West, those are, those corvids are, they have the biggest brain to body ratio of any living thing besides human beings and the great apes and maybe the cetaceans, the big whales, but, but, but really, I mean, some, 
some evidence is that they second to us really only. Yeah. They are smart and they often use their intelligence, not always to the best ends. Sometimes, sometimes they use their intelligence to be very cruel to, um, to one another. Sometimes they use that legendary intelligence to, um, torment other living things. They steal baby birds out of songbird nests. They sometimes eat songbirds themselves if the songbirds are really tired and can't evade them. But they are, they have some of our best, very best qualities too. They're problem solvers. They play even as adults. Very few animals play as adults. They play as youngsters, but they don't play when they're all grown up. Um, So you know, they, 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 they mourn their dead. They conduct what looks very much like funerals. They, they create tools, multi-part tools out of other objects. So I, I, I like the idea that there, there is for me a comfort in knowing yeah. that I belong to a world where my species is not alone. Mm-hmm. They're kin. Yeah. Um, I remember when we were talking about titles early on and you were really trying to hold fast to keeping crows in there and somebody somewhere on the team said, but oh, I don't know, people might get it, they might get confused because there's that Game of Thrones novel called right. Feast of Crows. And I said, Margaret, no one, no one is going to think of that when they look like what fool would think of Feast of Crows Game of Thrones novel when they look at your book? I kid you not. When this arrived at my house and it was sitting on my kitchen counter, John Philpot walked in the door and goes, hey, <laughs> there's a Game of Thrones novel called Feast of Crows. And I said, shut up. You do not say that to Margaret. But well, now I've just outed him. I remember. It. Do you remember what else you said to me about that? What? Said, How bad would it be if all those <laughs> zillions of fans who love the love the game of thrones accidental sales accidentally to buy your book when it comes out well they and you know what they would be confused that was an excellent point they'd be confused at first but then (laughs) they would feel really good um before before lonnie comes back with us i want to i want to read this wee little line from the gorgeous review from NPR for this book, and I want you to respond to it. Um, Barbara King wrote the review and she said, in these days of climate crisis, the phenomenon of ecological grief is real. In order to seize opportunities to help, many of us do require fuel to restore our spirits. You will find that fuel in this book. You're aware you're doing that, right? That you're creating fuel for people I was aware that that's what I hoped. That's what I hoped, but you never know. Yeah. Is that a heavy responsibility to think as you're writing, like, boy, I hope this is going to be just the fuel people need to not run and hide. Um, I feel almost a missionary zeal about that idea that we, this idea that we work to save what we love. Mm -hmm. And so I want as much to offer some kind of respite and sucker to those who are already in love and worried about the natural world. But I also want, I hope that maybe somebody who's not in love might think, oh, I'm going to spend a little time looking out my window too. I want to have this same kind of connection I think I would feel happier. I think it would make me feel better to feel like I belonged to this world and not that I was simply walking through it. Yeah. I love that. Um, Real quick, if this is something that can be answered real quick, things you now know, having published three fabulous books and having started that book publication journey, you know, Late. Not that we're old, but later than some people do. I'm you way know, older than you are. Let's be honest. Just, <laughs> you published you, your but, first book before you were 40 and I was 57. 57. Okay. So 57 with the first book. Mm-hmm. You've learned. What have you learned that you didn't know before? Here's what I really wish somebody had told me. 
Yeah. I can't believe in all the writing classes I took, no one did. Is that writing begets writing. Yes. When, when you're writing, it's almost like when you're running, not that I would know I run nowhere, but I hear that runners runners say, if they stop running, it takes almost no time to, to get out of shape and takes forever to get back in shape. But once you've got that process where you're just expecting to write, even if it's just a tiny little bit every day, Mm -hmm. it keeps that, that side of your brain engaged. And the wonderful thing about the human human brain is that it is constantly solving problems, even, even when we aren't directing it to do that, which is the reason you wake up in the middle of the night and you go, oh, that that was Angelina Jolie in that movie. You know, the, the <laughs> thought, it'll just pop up because your brain is solving that problem and writing a little bit every day. Um, it, 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 it makes it easier. You don't it have does. to wait. You don't have to wait till you said you have a week or the decks are cleared or you're um, you're feeling it. You know, mm-hmm. if you wait till you're feeling it, you'll be 57 before you write a book. It's the best part of it was the best thing that writing group did for me anyway, was introduce that practice and that concept because I had been waiting. And I don't know what I was waiting for, but I kept just thinking I don't have time sure. I don't have space but you don't have life. time when you when you have to have like it does take a pretty big chunk of time to reimmerse yourself into a project that you have abandoned or stepped mm-hmm. away from for a while whereas if you're sitting down with it a little bit every day which i'm saying this just talking 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 as though i know what i'm talking about even though i haven't written one thing towards the next book since August because I've been so yeah. focused on seeing the comfort of crows into the world, but it, it does make it easier to come back because you get right back into it. You don't have to refamiliarize yourself. You don't have mm-hmm. to go through that whole big, um, you know, should I really be doing this? Is this really, is anybody going to ever want to read this? You know, there's so many yeah. self doubts that come in when you step away. Yeah. And if you can keep the momentum going, I feel like even just the tiniest bit of momentum is enough to crowd out the doubt, the self-doubt that no one wants to hear this. Why, who cares about my voice? You know, these are the things that come out in my head. I also have not written a word since August because I too am ushering the comfort of crows into the world. (laughs) That is (laughs) Well, we are are clearly codependent. Like we can't do it without each other. (laughs) (laughs) There's Lonnie. I know Lonnie. Oh boy, what a conversation. It's been such a mood elevator just here in our office in, in <laughs> Evanston here. Amory and I, big smiles on our face. I've been getting texts from people saying, oh, lots and lots and lots of happy people on the Zoom. I want to remind folks, Amory, put it in one more time. You can come hang out with Mary Laura and Margaret and others at the after hours Zoom. It's a Zoom meeting. You can ask your own questions. You get to talk and unmute yourself. And how do you get there? You buy a copy of this extraordinary book with its extraordinary illustrations. I know you. Uh, I know fan folks are used to me saying I love all the people we host. It's a curated speaker series. It's not random. It's curated. Everyone is invited for a reason. Margaret, I told you this before when uh, back when you were at, uh, here for us for the liaison council meeting a couple weeks ago, you know, this this book, when I got the galley copy in the summer, I took it to the beach with me. I took it in my backyard and I I, I gave myself this. I understood this piece in your conversation where you were saying you can zip through it or you can really just really slow and take your time. And I took the slow approach. I would read. I wanted to read like, I'm going to read a whole season. Like I want to read like, I'm going to read all fall. Or I and I just made myself, I took two weeks at a time and they're short for folks wondering. These are two, three, four pages. These are not length. These are not like 27 page essays for each week. So I give myself, okay, I'm going to read two today. And I'd be like, <laughs> and, I'd get like and I'd open it up and I'd be like, oh. and I'd read it and it would hit me in such a, like, man, talk about true arrow. It would just go right in both my head and my heart at the same time. And I would finish and I'd close it and I would put it 
And I would just, my first practice was to just, okay, just close your eyes and just listen and smell. So if I was by Lake Michigan and the waves were roaring, kids, seagulls, wind, I would just listen. If I was in my backyard, I would listen to the bird feeder. I would listen to whatever might be happening. And then I'd be like, I would feel like it was like a daily diet. Like it was a vitamin. It was something that I simply <laughs> needed on a daily basis. I cannot encourage our, our viewers tonight more strongly to get this book, not for just yourself. What an incredible holiday gift, I might add. Great gift for um, one of your child's teacher. I mean, this is just, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. I'm gonna, if I'm gonna flip over here to a question. I want to encourage people come come to after hours come ask your own questions. Um, I and I was I was uh, empathetic to Catherine. She put a, a question in chat or into the Q and A tonight. She wanted to know if you have any tips, both of you. Well, first of all, also Mary Laura, you have earned some big fans tonight. People who are not familiar with your work, they're like, okay, I'm going to go buy your book right now. Books right now, exactly. Uh, Catherine is asking any tips on cultivating a writing group in your town, which becomes something of an expansion rather than pressure and expectations. She says she lives in a small town. She has young kids. She's at a certain point, part of the writing journey, hesitant to add something more. So do you guys have some tips on, cause you know, that is a little magical alchemy that you guys haven't go, have gone down there. I'm gonna, I was telling, I was thinking to myself, well, I, what would it take to move the fan office to Nashville? Um, <laughs> so Come on quick, down. Any quick tips for about cultivating that kind of supportive writers group? I'm going to let you, feel, you start, Mary Laura, because it was your idea, really. And we have two minutes, I mean, so it's it, lightning round. Yeah, it's 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 a chemistry thing. It's like it's almost like dating. I mean, I've, I've discussed writing with other people. You know, I've occasionally, you know, talked about writing with this person, shared something with that person, and, it, and there were not sparks. But there, we had, you know, when you have an intellectual conversation with somebody and there are sparks and you like the way the other person brain, the other person's brain works. And you can also tell when you're talking with someone and they are not someone who is super driven by ego and there's not going to be a situation of jealousy and you genuinely want to, to love that person's work and help that person's work do great. And they feel the same for you. And you're just in it for the craft and the work. You can feel that. And I don't know how, when you live in a small town, you find that person, but maybe that person is online and doesn't even live in your small town. That's the beauty think, of the internet. I think the online ones are like, I taught in a writer's workshop program, looking glass writer's workshop back in North Carolina, back in the spring. And mm -hmm. there was a woman in my, in my workshop who had a writer's group that was from all over and they met on zoom and, and, you know, like I know, Nashville has a wonderful writers resource called the Porch Writers Collective, and they do some classes online. And I think sometimes just taking a writer's class, writing class, and then seeing whose work you respect and want to learn from, and and just to approach one more person, and then you can expand out. We have three other um, members of our group that, um, well, one that comes consistently, and the other two that come when their lives permit. So you can expand slowly. It doesn't have to be the whole group all at once. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. It's eight o'clock. I hope we will see some of you two nights from now when we're hosting Black Thought Tariq Trotter from The Roots. What a night that's going to be. His memoir, Talk About uh, Deep and Beautiful, The Upcycled Self, it's called. It's just The Upcycled Self. Yes. Boy, I just well, all of a sudden I had a a brain freeze thinking is that the title of the book i think it is um mary laura thank you for such a beautiful interview of margaret margaret we'll see both of you in about five minutes at after hours thank you everybody for joining us in fanland tonight and we hope you have a great night <laughs>